There is something I've got to tell you now for me to be able to discuss the law. On Friday, June 13, 1980, Candace Montgomery killed Betty Gore. She did so with an ax. And she did so in self-defense. We haven't chosen to try our case in the papers, which is why you've never heard that before. But we've got quite a story to tell. You're going to hear what happened that day, June 13th, and guess what? You're going to hear it from the only living person who was there. Candy Montgomery will take the stand. She'll tell you exactly what happened. Welcome back to the official Love and Death podcast. I'm Nancy Miller. The title of episode six is The Big Top, as Candy's murder trial becomes a circus. This includes her showman of a lawyer, Don Crowder, who reveals a legal strategy that's nothing short of a high wire act. His client, Candy Montgomery, did kill Betty Gore, but it was an act of self-defense. Now, with the evidence against Candy, it's a huge risk, especially from a personal injury lawyer who has never tried a criminal case before. But there's an unshakable confidence to Don Crowder, a confidence that actor Tom Pelfrey embraced in his portrayal of the brash lawyer in Love and Death. It's a confidence Crowder enjoyed, in part, because of a level-headed young lawyer working alongside him named Robert Udishan. I'll be speaking with Texas Monthly editor Michael Hall about the real-life Don Crowder and Robert Udishan and their wild self-defense plea later in the show. Up first is my conversation with Tom Pelfrey in his scene-stealing role as Don Crowder. Here, he talks about why playing Don was like speeding around in a race car and why his dedication to perfecting Don's super 70s suntan went much more than skin deep. Tom Pelfrey, welcome to the companion podcast to Love and Death. Thank you so much for having me, Nancy. You play the lawyer, Don Crowder, who sort of starts out in the first few episodes of the series as a supporting character. But now, here we are getting into episode six, and Don Crowder is going to be the star of the show, both in court, in Candy's life, and for us, the viewers. So what did you know about Don Crowder going into this? What did you think when you saw the script? Um, when the project first came to my attention, I was actually in New Mexico, and we were still filming the first season of Out of Range. And they sent me, you know, this, they said here, they, they sent me the first four episodes. Mm -hmm. And they said, here's this new show. It's going to be a limited series written by David Kelly, who, of course, is is really one of the, the sort of living legends of of television. And um, I sat down to read one, as I said, I was filming at the time, and I thought I would read one and read a few over the next couple of days. I read all four in one sitting. And, and, I, and I said, this is amazing, this is incredible. Everyone who gets to be in it is gonna be happy they did it. And I don't understand why you're asking me to, <laughs> to read this. <laughs> And they said, they said, you know, it, it changes in the last couple episodes and Don becomes uh, a part of the story. Interesting. Um, which I also thought was just super cool. Like, it's so much fun when someone takes just even a little bit of that kind of like a risk with storytelling. I thought, how much fun is it, you know, to set up this world where we have this community and there's all these people in this community, and this guy is just a part of the community. He's right. just one of the other guys at the church. And then all of a sudden, everything changes, and now he's going to be my, you know, Candy's lawyer. Um, so, you know, David was like, it changes. And, you know, uh, and he, he, he was obviously telling the truth. And um, I just, I thought it was fascinating and, and was so excited to, to say yes. So how did you approach Don Crowder in a fresh way that didn't feel like a, a Texas caricature? It's a challenge. Getting to, to read the source material that David used to write the series and then also luckily finding some uh, more obscure interviews that really illuminated this, this man in such a way that, uh, you know, I think you always feel a sort of obligation or a responsibility especially when you're playing a real person to to ground them in 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 reality as much as possible 
I felt that especially strongly in this case because I was so taken by this really interesting, weird, quirky, I think deeply good man. So Don and Candy were friends. They attend the same church. They serve the same church council. When Candy approaches Don to be her lawyer, why does he accept? Is it ego? Is it duty? Is it loyalty? Is it brio? <laughs> I think at first he thinks that there's just no way that she did it. And then and then and so that 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 the the immediate reaction is almost one of you know, here's my friend who is being yeah. bullied and taken advantage of by the authorities. And, you know, one of the things I loved about Don was a real sense of this guy stood up. He was an underdog. He was an underdog. He stood up for underdogs. He didn't like anybody getting picked on. You know, he didn't, he did not like uh, if he felt like somebody was at a disadvantage and somebody else was taking advantage of them. So, you know, I think there's a sense of that. I think there's, I think Don was a, a bit of a showman and didn't have a problem with having attention. Um, and I also just think that being friends and being in the same church and the same community, I'm sure that he felt some, just a natural desire to help or protect uh, somebody that he was fond of as a friend. You know, having I've, I have had the opportunity to read the book. I had a chance to read the article in a detail that I loved about Don Crowder is the football career that kind of never happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And do you sense that there is this competitive player in Don? And that's part of the reason why he feels like everyone loves an underdog story in sports. Maybe we can get one in a murder trial. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's just fascinating. You read about him playing, you know, football in college and he breaks his ocular bone. So his eye comes out of his head playing football. Oh, yeah, like that, that, that level of injury. And that doesn't stop him. He wants to play. He wants to keep playing. Don was a smaller guy. The doctor sits him down and he's like, there's no way I'm going to clear you to play in the NFL. You know, and Don's like, well, what about this guy, so-and-so? He had this injury and that injury. And <laughs> doctor's like, yeah. And also, you know, he's about five inches taller and about 50 pounds heavier than you are. <laughs> Is Don's decision to defend Candy a reckless move? Like, what is your sense of their relationship? Sometimes you're not sure who's manipulating whom in these circumstances. So explain that relationship to me. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, I think at a certain point, things had, obviously, things had gotten so out of control and things were so beyond the realm of experience that Candy was used to that I, I, I would imagine that she really craved someone that she felt she could fully trust or mm -hmm. feel comfortable with. You know, when something like this happens all of a sudden an entire world comes into the sort of contained world that you knew before. Media, police, investigators, everyone's opinion, you're on the new, like, you know, they've been living in this sort of contained environment that just gets shattered open. And I imagine that when there's that much at stake, you want someone that you believe actually cares about you as a human being. You know, not just someone who's being hired to do a job. Candy, you're taking something. What is it? Xerox. It helps with my nerves. You need to understand something. That kind of carnage. Prosecution aims to depict you as inhuman. You look like a zombie plays right into their hands. Do not get cross with me. Do not get cross. It's the newspapers that are calling me a zombie and a monster, and they all want me to break down and act like one, don't they? No more Sarex, Candy. The jury needs to see you as human, vulnerable. They won't find in your favor unless they want to. You need to cry, cry. But unfeeling buys you prison. So you get to play opposite Elizabeth Olsen, who's playing Candy. And the, up until now, Candy is clearly the star 
of her own show, for better and for worse. Now the dynamic is shifting. She's entrusting her life into Don's hands. Did you talk about that with Elizabeth, how you guys were going to sort of share this power, two scene stealers sharing a scene? We did not talk about it once. And I have to say that that is such a huge credit to Lizzie. She is such a smart actor. I mean, I would call her the machine. I mean, truly the machine. You see some of the scenes that she does in this show, and I was there when we were filming them. One take. Like, whoa. And I pride myself on being able to be pretty efficient. I was floored by how prepared and how good Lizzie is. And she is so smart. So when she reads that script, she understands that there's a change in the dynamic and she just switches, you know? And I understand that there's a change in the dynamic and I switch and we didn't have to talk about it once. Oh, that must be cool. And every scene with her felt so natural. Oh, it was so cool. It's so nice. It's such a pleasure. It's like being in a band or something. You're absolutely right. It's like being in a cool band because you get to be better because your partner's better, you know? You watch what Lizzie's doing, you watch how she shows up and it's like, man, now I, I can just do whatever I want because I, I, don't, I don't have to think twice about you and you're not going to let me down. You know, it was very natural. We didn't have to have one conversation about it. All right. We got to talk about that suntan. <laughs> let me tell you, I must have been driving everyone crazy because I was obsessed with that tan. I was like, we need to get this tan and we need to get it right. You don't understand. Like, you know... We, I got, I got the opportunity on multiple occasions to talk to Robert Udishin, the the actual lawyer who was Don's partner, and he said, "Tom, every day at lunch, <laughs> he'd go on the roof of the law office with his little running shorts and tan." <laughs> and so I thought, okay, this guy looked good. He looked tan. He was very particular about that. And we need to make sure that we, we, we do him justice there. So we started with a little bit of makeup. I like how you're saying we, by the way, because it's like you have a team tan. You have team tan. That's just like a we. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this is this not a one-man job. Is, no, we ha I needed help. <laughs> I needed help because I tried to go to the tanning bed, and I got burnt, and then it just... It went back to pale. So then <laughs> a try to is like some kind of makeup. And I was like, ah, it's going to rub off on everything. What we need and what we did is full body spray tanning. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go more than three days without getting a fresh coat. <laughs> <laughs> My quotes were always more and darker. <laughs> Let's talk about the opportunity to return to this late 1970s masculine Texas ideal. How did you understand that kind of Texas male identity and how did that inform your depiction of Don Crowder? Well, it's it's very it's 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 fun because in so many ways Don is Don has got so many um god, what would you call it? Almost sort of competing dynamics like on the one hand he's so He's so sort of masculine and rugged. And on the other hand, he's, he's very kind of vain and particular about his appearance, you know? And I thought like, what a great, I mean, look, David wrote it in the script, but what a great opportunity. I added the cigarette because I was like, let's get it all in one picture. Now, as we move on in, in the, in the series, Don has to take on Candy's narrative, right? And that means exploring these kind of wilder theories about why she did what she did. He shocks the, everyone in the courtroom with that she did it, but it's a self-defense. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. And I don't know as much about law as David does, so I don't know how much the idea of introducing hypnosis and, and, and sort of talking more about mental health, I don't know how novel that was. It seems pretty novel for the time. But I, I also thought just in terms of, of our storytelling, I thought it was where Don takes Candy to see Dr. Faison, mm -hmm. the hypnotist. And he gets to experience her visceral recollection of 
you know, certain events and, and see the emotion of that. And look, you know, you and I both know it's just like a human being thing. Like when you're around someone who's having that kind of a deep visceral experience, you know, it's real. And, and it, it makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck and it moves you and you feel it in your gut. And the way I interpreted the story was that, you know, he might have been grasping at straws a little bit until he witnessed that. And I, I believe that once he saw that, even not being able to fully explain it or understand it himself at the time, knew enough to know, like, whatever that is, is, is real. Mm. And if that's real, I need to, my job as her advocate is to be able to articulate what that means. Yeah. And that's where I think it was just kind of this genius luck thing that Don was a personal injury lawyer before. Like, I think a sense of the theatrical, but also a sense of like keeping things grounded. Yeah. Like I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a story that you're going to remember. Yes, right. Now, you mentioned that you spoke with Robert Udishin to better understand Don. What were those conversations like? You know, Robert is a lovely, uh, kind of soft-spoken, um, very sweet man. And, and he was, you know, he was there to sort of give credence to the fact that Don was larger than life and very boisterous and, and very um, powerful. He's like, you know, when he walked in a room... <laughs> Don walked in a room, you know, and everyone knew it. And so Robert was telling a story. <laughs> Robert was telling a story at a certain point where Don was coaching his daughters in basketball and Robert was coaching his daughter or somebody else. Anyway, Robert was coaching 12 year old girls and Don was coaching eight and nine year old girls, which the the size and height difference at that time for those ages is gigantic. Don challenged Robert's team to play. So again, Don has the smaller, <laughs> much younger girls. And Robert <laughs> Robert said, Don coached that game like his life hung in the balance. <laughs> right, I'm afraid to ask. Who won? Robert's team won. But I was like, man, that is the story that pretty much encapsulates everything I think that is so beautiful about Don is like one that, yeah, this is a man who's going to spend his free time coaching kids sports, which is a beautiful thing. And two, if he's going to do it, he's going to do it to win. <laughs> Um, were you attracted to playing this character because he reflected a part of you or was a, different than you and that was exciting to play? Both. I mean, both. Of course, I, I hope that some of his good qualities are qualities that I have. And, and also, it's just, I, I think it's so much fun to play someone who has so much confidence. You know, uh, often just... For, for me as an actor, often I'm sort of getting to play roles where there's a sort of deep inner turmoil or conflict. And I love that, don't get me wrong, and spend a lot of time there. But to get the opportunity to play someone who's sort of unapologetically confident, assertive, clear, knows what he wants, it's like, oh, man, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I told David, I was like, I really mean this, too. I was like, dude, getting to show up on set and playing Don Crowder as written by you with your dialogue felt like going to work every day to drive a race car around the track. It was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and we will hear more of Don's voice and see more of that incredible tan in Episode 7, which is the finale to the limited series. Thank you so much. Nancy, thank you. This, this was a real pleasure. I, it, seriously, it's such a great time talking to you. Thank you. How did Don Crowder have the confidence to build such a bold legal strategy of self-defense? Well, he had help. Two young lawyers named Robert Udishin and his associate, Ling Carpenter, played by Adam Cropper and Kristen Sawyer Davis in the series. To talk more about Candy's legal team and the outsized antics that took place in the real-life case, I'm here with Michael Hall, an executive editor at Texas Monthly. 
Michael Hall, welcome to the official Love and Death podcast. And by the way, I cannot think of a better writer beat than yours. Your bio says, Mike Hall writes about criminals, musicians, the law, and barbecue. Nothing better. That's, that's <laughs> the best. Those are my favorite things about Texas. We've got at least three out of four in this series of Love and Death and talking about the story of Candy Montgomery, the murder of Betty Gore, and where we are in episode six is in the midst of a trial. A trial that, from what I understand, was unprecedented in late 70s, early 80s Texas, maybe even the United States. When we think about high-profile cases, there were media circuses. We think OJ, that's the 90s. But it seems to me, according to this series, this was a huge media circus. So can you tell me about that? What, tell me about the scale of this trial. I mean, this was a small town. It's, it's not that far from Dallas. And, you know, small towns in Texas, when something like this happens, it it's, takes over everything. And we're talking 1980. You know, we're yeah. talking before the Internet. We're talking before social media. We're, we're talking three television stations. And, you know, it was a very different world. And a, a, a small town back then, it was like a, a big high school, you know. Every, uh -huh. Everybody knows each other. Everybody's kids play with each other. Um, you know, at the courthouse, everybody knows each other. All the lawyers know each other. So when something happens that's a little untoward, everybody knows about it. And when there is a, <laughs> an axe murder among two women who sing in the same choir, and one of whom was having an affair with the husband of the other, it blows up pretty big. We just spoke with Tom Pelfrey, who plays Don Crowder in the series. What can you tell me about the real-life Don Crowder and his legal partner, Robert Udishin? How did their partnership come about in real life? Crowder was a really interesting guy. He was, for one thing, he, he was a civil lawyer. You know, he, he dealt with uh, personal injury cases, uh, workman's comp cases. You know, not, not the sexiest things for a Texas lawyer. I mean, usually when you think of Texas lawyers, you think of criminal lawyers like uh, Percy Foreman or Racehorse Haynes or Dick DeGaron, guys who were representing uh, <laughs> killers. Well, Don Crowder was a civil lawyer, and he worked for a firm that included another guy named Jim Maddox, who would eventually become the attorney general of Texas. Oh. And so they, they, they did civil cases for the most part. But they had a really young guy named Robert Udishan who would handle their criminal cases. So, you know, criminal cases and civil cases are very different. And most of their cases were dealing with personal injuries. But every once in a while, there would be a criminal case, and they would call in 27-year-old Robert Udishan. Now, he seems to be Don Crowder's not-so-secret weapon, right? Absolutely. Don and Candy went to the same church. So when Candy got in trouble, she went to Don. Don said to her, this is a criminal matter. You need to talk to my buddy, Robert. So Candy talks to Robert. And when Candy actually gets arrested, Don really hands it off to Robert because Don doesn't know what to do. This is all Robert's territory. Even though Robert's only mm -hmm. been out of law school for three years, he knows how to deal with this. So Robert handles all of the pretrial hearings, everything. The most important thing that Robert does with Elaine Carpenter, who also worked in the uh, law firm, they sat down with Candy. When Candy acknowledged that she had, in fact, killed Betty, they sat down with her and developed a strategy on how to deal with this. And what Robert did is, after Candy told him the story, he realized there's a self-defense claim here. You know, Wow. Candy went over to Betty's house Candy didn't take a weapon. Candy just showed up there. All of a sudden, according to Candy, Betty brings out an axe, takes a swing at her, and eventually Candy fights back and kills her. What Robert and Elaine realize is they have a problem here. They have a self-defense claim, but they need to get over the overkill claim. Why did you you hit her 41 times. Why didn't you just hit her once if, if it's really self-defense? So it mm -hmm. was Robert who came with the, up with the idea, 
of going to find a psychiatrist to try and explain how this overkill could happen and how it could be made still to work in a self-defense claim. So we know how the duo team up for this trial in real life. Don and Robert seem to complement each other in terms of their skill set. Yeah. What was their individual dynamic and presence like? Yeah, he was, Don was a real larger than life guy. You know, Don was apparently this scrawny kid who willed himself into being a big linebacker type teenager. So he worked himself up. He built himself up from being this scrawny kid to being a kid who actually uh, had a chance to play professional football. He had this tremendous will to do what he wanted to do. And he was very full of himself. He loved appearances. He apparently was always going to the tanning salon because he liked the way the tan made him look. He was obsessed with how he looked. He was always working out. He was a very um, type A personality. And so he was the perfect guy to take this case into court. Robert had developed it, had developed the narrative. Uh, Robert had sat down with Candy and with this psychiatrist, uh, uh, Fred Faison, and they had worked through with Candy's help, obviously, because Candy was the only survivor of the this altercation. They worked out the narrative of what she said happened. And now they just needed Don to transmit that narrative. And, you know, Robert, I think, was more of a kind of a quiet guy. And Don was a very loud guy. Don very much believed in himself, very much loved the spotlight. Um, and so when Don got a chance to take this narrative into the court where everybody was just had their minds blown by it, everybody knew Candy had done it. And they had the audacity to bring it up as self-defense. Oh, my God. And Don was such a, 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 an over-the-top personality that he just, he, he didn't look back. You spoke with Robert Udishan, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you, when you spoke with him, did you talk about the frenzy, this sort of juxtaposition of this court case with this wild media frenzy that's happening and almost an information sharing that might have been happening? Yeah, I mean, at one point, they were trying to figure out what really happened with Candy and one of the things they did was take her to get a polygraph. And they got the results, and the results said that she was being truthful. Uh, those results wound up in the newspaper. And Candy didn't tell, and Robert didn't tell, and he was like, what is going on here? They had no control even over the basic information that a lawyer and a client are supposed to have, you know, that's, that's sacred between you. And I think that there was so much activity, so much chaos that, uh, you know, Dallas had two newspapers at the time, and they were covering this nonstop. It was all over the local news. Now, you spoke with, with Robert. He's alive and, and well, and what's, what's he up to now? Uh, Robert lives in Asheville, North Carolina. He still works uh, part-time for his law firm back in Dallas. He's still very much a part of the Texas legal community. You know, Robert went on to have a hand in six exonerations, um, including a guy I wrote about 15 years ago. I mean, Robert is not unsympathetic to somebody who's been wrongly convicted. So he's, he's, a, he's a fascinating guy. He, he became a, a law professor. He talked about the Candy Montgomery case a lot. He, uh, he became a pretty well-known guy. He had a, a very distinguished career as, as a defense lawyer and, and professor. And so the episode ends with TikTok, TikTok, which is, I think, how we can end this interview for episode six as we find out what's going to happen with Candy Montgomery next in episode seven. Thank you so much, Michael Hall, for joining us on episode six. We're going to have you back in episode seven of this podcast, and we'll see you then. I can't wait. Next week, for the final episode of Love and Death, we'll speak with series star Elizabeth Olsen about the final verdict in the case, along with series director and executive producer Leslie Linka Glatter, one last time about what really happened in that laundry room. See you Thursday, May 25th, for the series conclusion. The official Love and Death podcast is an HBO Max production in partnership with Texas Monthly Studio. 
the in-house agency for Texas Monthly. Our executive producers are Maddie Builder and Aaron Kabatsky. The podcast is written, produced, and hosted by me, Nancy Miller. Brian Standifer is our audio engineer, editor, and mixer. Music is courtesy of Warner Media, HBO Max, and Brian Standifer. Watch Love and Death now on HBO Max.